warriors. Today is a very special day. I am so excited to bring to you one of my favorites, Carly Gibson. Carly, <laughs> Carly, Carly, I don't even know where to start with you. Um, I'm going to start with you're an actress, you're a writer, you're a musician, you are just a force to be reckoned with in my book. Uh, I met you probably about 20 years ago here in New York City True. when you arrived, a young lady, to star on Broadway as Tracy Turnblad in the wonderful musical Hairspray. And I've been just following along everything and from afar, just amazed at what you're doing, your journey, uh, whether it was your mom, and you can speak about anything you want, uh, it, marriage, it was losing weight. It was starring in television shows. But before we get started, I want to urge everybody, Carly right now is starring in a Netflix movie as that saucy, sassy Aunt Cindy in <laughs> Holiday in the Vineyards. And I just uh, finished watching it uh, two nights ago. I watched it. So I urge everybody, not right now, when we're done, everybody, to go and watch this. Watch it's this first. Yes, absolutely. Because it's a real feel good piece. And in this overwhelming environment, I think we're all in, we need to just feel good. We need to have a little maybe fantasy absolutely. Ro romance and just forget about everything for a little while. So it's I want to thank you, Carly, because that's what it did for me. It took me oh, out good. of everything I'm doing. So welcome, Carly Gibson to the Warriors. Thank you. Now, let's start with you. Let's start go back. A little. Yes, we're going to start with you. First of all, where do you like everybody to follow you? Is it Instagram? Instagram is great. That's I post most of my updates there. That's where people can find out like what's going on when I'm doing local shows, when things are coming out. So Instagram is probably the best. It's just at Carly Gibson. Good, because that's what I thought. And that's J-I-B-S-O-N, everybody. You have no excuse. Easy, Carly Gibson. Let's take you back. I think so. <laughs> You'll be surprised though. You'll be surprised how people go out of their way to mess it up. And you're like, really? I, I Don't even get me started. I mean, really didn't start it because I named everything Lynn's Warriors thinking I named it all after myself kind of thing. So it would be easy. Um, but, but we're going to leave that for a minute. The uh, confusion people seem to have today. I want to take you back. You talk about anything, share with us anything you want. Take us back to Michigan. Take us back to where it all started. Take it back to how how'd you arrive in New York City? Because I'm going to let you talk in a minute, but I have yeah. to tell you something. I just, before I forget this, okay. When you arrived, Hairspray was made up of a lot of young people to cast. And I remember being at meetings, our production office, han very, very handy. It was right across the street from the theater. Yep. And so I was keeping an eye on things or I would go to try to, you know, be a cheerleader or just check in with people. That included cast, that included box office people, crew, just always trying to empower. And I remember Carly at a meeting bringing up, why don't we have, now they laughed me right out of the room. I am not exaggerating. I'm like, why don't we have like a mentoring program when we bring young people to New York City, Broadway, and just kind of like be there for them? And Carly, everybody laughed at me. I kid you not. I think it's a wonderful idea. And I think anybody coming to New York, you know, in these shows, in show business, I don't care what it is, needs for people older uh, who are a little more experienced. Or Absolutely. To help out. And so I'm very driven now at my age. My my kids are older now. I don't have to worry about, you know, homework and all that. Other issues. But, you know, uh, we have to get back to that. We have to get back to mentoring. We have to get back to society. We have to really Absolutely. empower our, our girls and women. So let's start there. Let's start with you in Michigan. And how did you end up on West 52nd Street? Absolutely. Well, honestly, like, it's funny that you mentioned that that's something that I think I would have greatly benefited from being that I was so young and not necessarily naive. I kind of was always an old soul. And I, I had a, a I dealt with a lot of adult things, you know, kind of um, being a, a true elder millennial. I came up in a time where like children um, were just exposed to a, a, a lot of, a lot of things really quickly. I came up in the age of the internet. So like, I wasn't as naive as m maybe generations before me would have been at that age, but I wasn't prepared. And, and there was no way that I could be. I was really young. I was, um, I was doing a show. I was doing a regional theater show at a, um, at a company in my hometown called Cherry County Playhouse, which is, has gone under years, um, years ago. 
but I was doing an original new works that was written by Christopher McGovern and Bill Whitefield and Bill Castellino was directing it. And it was a really irreverent sort of um, eight piece ensemble, young person show that at the time, remember this is like 2002, um, dealt with um, coming out young to abortion, to losing your virginity, to the Columbine massacre. Like it was basically like, what are children in this dawning of the, the millennial happening? Like the, what are they dealing with and how are they dealing with this emotionally? This is a lot coming at them, right? Like, you know, so um, it was a really great uh, project. And because there was a lot of talk about it, there was talk about moving it to New York. So there was a New York agent by the name of Brett Adams, who who passed away years ago, but was a huge, huge supporter and mentor of mine. Um, their agency is, is still around in New York. They're one of like the older and more respected boutique agencies in New York. And I still adore them all. Um, and he came and saw the show because he was re uh, representing the writer and director. And um, and he just saw me. And this was before, this was right before Hairspray went out of town to Seattle. So this is the summer of 2001. And, um, and I just got a call randomly after that happened. That was the summer before my senior year of high school. I got a call around Christmas time. And he, it was the funniest thing too, because again, like, my mom and I just didn't know anything. And like, she got the phone call and actually came to my school and was like, Broadway called, like as if it was like an <laughs> INC with like women in sweaters typing and um, that they just like put out phone calls. And um, essentially he was informing us that there was a new musical coming out and that he felt that I would be very right for it, but they didn't know where anything stood. It was still kind of new and there was a lot of talk, but no one really knew. And that was all I needed to hear. I was a very precocious child who was enthusiastic about theater and, and performing and nothing else, meaning academically things were just like not going well for me. And uh, so I was like, that's it. I'm, I'm going to move to New York. My mom was like, ugh please just finish high school. Like, please just like get your education. So I made a deal with her that I, I would at least finish high school. And then, um, and then I, then I found out that they were, they were moving after the, uh, the Seattle run that they were going to be moving forward with Marissa so that they weren't going to be holding in auditions, but to know that the show was already looking like it was going to be a hit, there would probably be a tour replacements, blah, blah, blah. So to hold tight. That was really it. That's all I needed to know. I um, I promised and swore that I would do correspondence classes and graduate uh, that way. And so I was uh, through an early graduation party and took that money and I moved to New York and I never did the correspondence classes. And to this day, I don't hold a high school diploma. <laughs> I just, I could not be stopped. So I moved to New York basically just on this, on this phone call, this idea that this thing could happen. And I am so grateful that it did. I basically showed up with like, I don't even know, $1,200, which at the time was kind of just, you know, just not a lot of money. And, um, and yeah. basically just showed up at the agency was like, I'm ready. And they were like, okay. So I, I went in immediately and auditioned for Telsey and it was pretty much from then on, it was about 10 months over the next, well, I would say like eight to nine months like 12 auditions of just like vetting and weaning down girls and getting us, you know, really figuring out who had it and, and who was going to be able to hold it. Cause it is, it's not just about, it's, it's the maintenance of it. It's, it's the nuance of it. Like there's just so many moving parts to Tracy and it's a really complicated role um, to cast. So they were very, um, they were very efficient in doing that. And then when I found out, I got it. It was like the April of I that I I booked the first national tour that I was going to open the tour. It was like April of 2003 and um I was broke, I was out of money, so I went home and just waited for rehearsals to start and that was kind of that. But I will say like, you know, it was fascinating to me. I was 18 years old and cuz I was 17 when I came out to New York, I was 18 when I booked it. I actually turned 19 in rehearsals. And um it, nothing can prepare you for what that is. I had such a love for the art form. I enjoyed performing. I obviously had natural talent, but to understand the business side of things, to understand how this becomes a machine, that it, it's, it's more than just having a love for, you know, musical theater and singing on stage discipline and, 
and all that goes in with it. And that like, yes, these people are your friends, but you also should be very getting into your life. None of those things were on my radar. And so I learned a lot of lessons the hard way. And I also had, I had a hard childhood and some, a lot of things that have taken me the last 20 years to sort of cope with that I was in no emotional, uh, no, I had no maturation in that area of my life to be dealing with that. So because I, you know, didn't know what to do, I drank a lot. I partied a lot. I just didn't know how to handle the stress and pressure of having an $11 million show on my shoulders at that age with no coping mechanisms with, with, and, and just thrown into the abyss of it yes. all. When we're saying that I take full responsibility for any decisions that I made in that time in my life, this isn't about, you know, blame or, or sort of, um, passing the buck in any way, but I greatly benefited from some sort of mentorship, some sort of, and it, and it would have had to come from, I might intervene a lot or whatever, but I, I, I was now emboldened with a large sum of money. So like you could thing, but if it was coming from an, a, a person of experience in the industry, I think I would have valued that a little bit more and definitely benefited from it. I learned a lot of things the hard way. And incidentally, as a result of it, struggled with refinding my love for theater as a result of it, because it was the most bittersweet time of my life. It was the best and worst years of my life. You know, Carly, first of all, thank you for sharing all of that. Um, I'm all about honest and open communication, yeah. you know, coming, coming from, from you, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say this, that, ask you a million questions it has to come from you. It's your story. I just think, and clearly I am turning 63 in a couple of weeks. Yeah. So I yeah, I am. But I love it, Carly. And I feel like I'm the smartest I've ever been. I feel mm -hmm. like I'm the most powerful I've ever been. I'm in the best shape of my life, physically, emotionally. There's like nothing that is going to stop me. Therefore, we now have the warriors that started a couple of years ago. But I want in your story, you know, fast forward now, 20 years later, I'm also working on another program not everybody's cut out for high school and academics, this one size fits all. We, we have to have more, you know, in science, technology, arts, all of that. We have the studies, arts increase an overall child's awareness, a teen's awareness in everything else in life. You do better. So like I'm pushing that, I'm working on that. Um, so forget those correspondence classes. You don't yeah. need that. <laughs> I mean, it's, you, it's no, because you don't, you don't need that. You don't need that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but well, I, I, mean, I just think it's important to say like, it's, it's, it's not about, you know, I don't poo poo an education in, in any right. form of the matter, but there is not a one size fits all. Right. You know, it's important to understand that like everybody has different strengths yes. and weaknesses and there are different paths you can take in life and they should be paths that are available without stigma, without judgment. You know, we need all the types of people in the world. You know, so Absolutely. it's very important for people to understand that and to have sort of uh, not just a support, but an outlet to find those resources. Because, you know, I come from a very sort of uh, lower middle to lower class, you know, area that, that I grew up in. And a lot of the choices were marriage and pregnancy or military. You know what I mean? Like right. there's just there's just not a lot of options to get out or, you know, to, to do something other than sort of what the status quo in yeah. those, you know, those middle states are. So it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. And, um, and I love, I love what you're doing. You know, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that about, there's such a, there's such an interesting and incredibly incorrect stigma around women and aging and and it, it really just comes down to sort of this misogynistic view of of, of, of are you you to men it's really what it comes down to right um but completely disregarding the fact that like they are disgusting right and they can just be disgusting and whatever and that doesn't matter um but it's funny because i guess i always had this sort of innate fear of aging um, the industry is not kind to women who age. Um, society is not kind to women who age. I remember my grandmother telling me at a very early age, like you become invisible. It was just like this thing that she said that always stuck with me about how you just stop being in the zeitgeist anymore. You stop being, 
you know, the, you know, the part of the, the pulse of what things are, you become sort of a outer character. And, um, and, and I just always, I don't know, that just always sort of fascinated me. And, and yet I see women who are coming into their 40s, 50s, 60s, stronger, sexier, more powerful, more set in who they are. They don't take any BS from anybody. They got no more Fs to give. Like it's just freeing and liberating. And I'm loving to see this because it is setting a stage for those of us that have like sort of been taught to fear getting older. You know what I mean? It's like with every passing day, but it's part of it's part of your journey and what you earn. And, um, and so I, I just applaud you for that. I love that. Well, amen, sister, you know, I, but I have to say that. So at this age, Carly, now I can look back. I was a kid, but I was at the tail end. This is even before you were born, you know, of the women's movement. Okay. Where women, I grew up in Jersey, New Jersey, they were hanging bras on trees, every kind of woman, every religion, every color, didn't matter. All the women came together. They are marching on Fifth Avenue across the country, marching in Washington. They're not doing it now, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Everybody is so a lot has changed in 20 years. Let's let's yeah. keep it within like since you came to New York. It's changing on a daily basis. Yeah. Um people are scared. I don't blame them. The women are not coming together. I am very worried about our girls. You know, yeah. again, growing up in the in the internet bubble, as I call it. I'm blaming the internet. Well, we have studies, so I'm not blaming them. It's we have real. a lot of it's, it's real, you know. Um, they're not, despite all the talk, this is my experience at least of, you know, girls, uh, we're going to empower women. We're going to come together. They're really not. And I'm seeing this in the last few years. I'm concerned for instance, um, geez, women, my age posing on TikTok. I don't know. in bikinis. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not being judgy. Go, go for it if you want, but what kind of message it, or like, are we sending? I'm very concerned about our, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade girls going into yeah. high school. We have to start earlier and earlier because of the internet. They're learning everything on the internet. Absolutely. So I, what are you, what's, what are your thoughts think, on all of yeah, this? Yeah, I think what's hard about it, I have, I have a couple thoughts about it. I think what's hard about it is not unlike everything we've talked about today, there is no one size fits all. You know, the idea in my in my sort of interpretation that the women's live movement was about having autonomy, true autonomy, meaning I get to choose the way I want to do things and you can choose the way you do. And the two don't need to, to, to cross intersect at any point of judgment or, or infringement. Right. And that's sort of the big idea of it. Right. The problem with it is it's been the, the concept and the ideology has been hijacked. Everything in this country has been monetized in one way or another, and then eventually weaponized. So I think, I think what happens is, is like, we, we sort of fall into these traps of, of arguing these semantics when it's, when really the danger is that like, we need to make sure that like Roe v. Wade becomes reinstated, that like mm -hmm. that, the, that, that we're being protected medically, that research is still being done on endometriosis, which is something that they only started doing in the 90s. They used to just give every woman a hysterectomy the minute she complained about having cramps. Right. And and as someone who like went through this myself and realizing like they've only been actually starting to do research on women's reproductive cancers and things like that within the last 20 years, yeah. kind of because it became so prevalent, like there is no world in this day and age where a woman should be dying of ovarian or cervical or uterine cancer of any types. Like we should have pre-screenings and all these types of things. So it's like, as much as I understand it's valid to to sort of question the imagery that's taking place. To me, that's all like sort of this corporate smoke show that's just distracting yes. us from the fact that like, we are actually losing our, our rights as women. Yes. That's and, what I'm talking um, about. Yeah, and so, um, you know, I, I've, I've had to kind of arrive at this place because again, being, being a child of this like dawning of the internet has been fascinating. I sit, because I was born in 1984, so I sit in this really interesting cusp where I remember, life before the internet and life at the dawning of and now of course we all live in this and um but in my formative years so i was like 13 when we got aol in the house it was it was very um influential in my life and and it you know it's it's 
it's i do believe and agree and like you said there's there are there are studies that support this these aren't necessarily theories there are numbers that support this that like it is the beginning of the degradation of our society to a degree what i think it's taken away is personal accountability when you can put a veil between you and the thing you either say or post or do it distorts your reality where people are saying things, doing things, posting things that they maybe wouldn't do at the grocery store or at their family dinner or, you know, in a public forum in any way. And it is creating a false sense of who we are as people. And then there is no sort of compass or true north anymore because there there really is no consequence for any of it. I mean, sometimes, obviously, people go really far. Maybe they'll lose their job or, you know, something like that. But, but I... I to me, it's that it's that we're losing our sense of connection, human connection. And we are a tribal being as as human beings. We are meant to be communal. We are meant to be tribal. We, we, we are meant to be to connect, to 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 relate all of those things. And, and, and this is separating us more than anything. And I think that's really the generational divide that you are seeing is that people are going through individually with very distorted information and very sort of isolated versions of themselves from society. It's it's kind of the wild, wild west in, in the weirdest way. And so I think oh, it is. Yeah. doing what you're doing and what, I, what I'm seeing a lot of women doing is attempting to reinstate these sort of communal places where women can come together, hopefully in a, in a, in a free space, in a safe space, in a protected space where they feel not judged. Um, I think is vastly important and the only true way out of whatever this is. Well, we know the country, the world has changed and that's yeah. fine because the other argument, Carly, I, I was just at a holiday party the uh, other day and they kept talking about the way it used to be. I don't right. care how it used to Now, just follow along. Like <laughs> we have to be in the now and going forward. It's like for people to sit around, I'm sorry, it's so boring for me. It's like now. So I always have this hashtag, you know, community creates change. How do we how do we live comfortably, safely, help each other? You know, it starts in the home. It starts in the community. That's all we can do. And then hope it spreads out and snowballs and we get new warriors. And, you know, we talk about things. Um, just just going back for a second, you know, with the with the women's movement, that was also about, you know, equal pay in jobs, which right. we still don't have. Like, right. and I'm afraid, as you pointed out, all these distractions and things are taking us away from these necessary things we need to talk about. I, as I sit here in New York State, we work with a lot of coalitions. Everything's bipartisan. None of this work, you know, belongs to right. any political right. parties. That's the right. way I look at it, right? We look yep. at it. Uh, New York State, Carly, right now wants to legalize prostitution. Now, that sounds great on the surface, but what it really means is legalizing pimping, trafficking, brothel owning, sex buying, because we have studies that just show us about 97% of women, all people, we have to always remember boys and men are in the sex trade too. Um, they actually want out of the sex trade if they could, if there's a place to go, if there were monies, if they had, a, you know, could get the roof over sure. their head and we don't have it in our country. So we right. want, of course, if somebody wants, if you want to be in the sex trade, great. But if you right. want out, if you want out, we want to help yeah. you. We don't want to legalize this pimping and trafficking because I'm telling you, this will increase. And and the problem I have, Carly, is that we'll just have the criminals trafficking more women and it's becoming you know normalized. We need our women to be, whether it's education, whether it's going into the arts, you know, whatever path they want to take, not just thinking being, you know, a sexual object, that's all you yeah. got going for you. You know, so it's a right. whole big conundrum going on. We're fighting very hard to help people. Yeah. I, I work directly with a lot of prostitutes in right now or ones yeah. who have gotten out of that life. We don't have the resource. It, it like hurts me every day. Like I, we, we want to empower, we want to help, you know, fight you know what's, what's so disheartening about all of this is like, if this is, this is one of many issues, right? Like we have this issue with, with like how it's regulation versus no regulation, right? And we have this with 
you know, with gun control, we have this with our unhoused communities. Like how much do we have an obligation to create resources outside of just a meal a day? You know, it's it's hard because again, and I, I don't say this to, to just be trite in any way, there is no one size fits all. So we are the the, it, the, what's unique about our country is that we are a massive country geographically and population wise. And we are, we are also, you know, made up of, of, of many different types of people. It's kind of similar in that, like, I guess, and I, and I forgive me, I'm asking this question because you obviously are a far more well-versed on, on the statistics than I am, but you know, it's kind of like with, uh, with drugs. And they legalized marijuana and and regulated it and then, you know, made it a, a full government operation. The the move sales went down because the, the drug dealers that are pushing marijuana were like, well, we're going to go out of business because of whatever. Did it stop moving drugs entirely? No, because the hard stuff is what they're really after. And that's what really moves. But there are studies that show that when you do regulate things and you do create an environment where it's more controlled then and I know this is like, I can like hear my mother, my bless her soul in my book being like, but government can't be in anything. And I agree. Like, I don't want to, I don't subscribe to this sense of like, let's regulate every single thing. But I do think in my personal opinion, and I would want to do more research that you obviously have about why you think it would actually create more pimping and, and things of that. Because if there was a way that it could be unionized, where like, let's say they could actually get benefit. I mean, let's just be honest. It's called the oldest profession for a reason. This isn't going away. It just isn't right. So if we could find a way to like unionize it and sort of destigmatize it and 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 take all of the I just the problem is I don't think this is ever going to happen because we live in this sort of religious, you know, self-righteous place that like they're just never going to do it. Sex is always going to be brown paper bagged in this country, which is where the deviance, I think, really comes from. People aren't actually allowed to openly and freely express their sexuality or fetishes or whatever it may be. And I think that's where, and some of them you shouldn't, obviously there's terrible, awful, disgusting things going on and things with children. But do you think that there is a path at all to, to within the, um, within regulation to bringing it down at all and getting some kind of control of it? And then I agree with you entirely about like, also getting a path out of it where, you know what I mean? Like finding a way to be like, this This should not be your only option. Here, Here's my concern. My concern is, yes, there is, you know, we base a lot of our work. I do a lot of work uh, for New York City, New York State, also on the federal level. So there is something called the equality model. Again, mm -hmm. that is getting people who choose, who choose, nobody's forcing you, choose, give them that path to reclaim their lives, Okay but hold responsible the pimps, the traffickers. Remember, Carly, anything right. people say to me every day, like, why is this happening? I'm like, cause it's money. Yeah. I don't want to, there's so much money to be made. The problem we have going on is um, now wait till you hear this one. At, Cause I've been to the Senate. I've been to Albany, our state Capitol. They literally say to me, we, we have to have legalized prostitution. It's the only job for our trans community. I'll be like, what? I'll be like, shouldn't we be helping them? Shouldn't we have corporate sponsors to give them job training or maybe education? Maybe we have school programs. Or and they ask say, why is it the only path for that, them? But that's what I do. And I get no met place with in society for them. I get met with such faces, the way they stare at me. And to to say, oh, trans community, you know, trans has been in the headlines a lot. You know from being in show business. I know we've been around gay people, trans people, it doesn't matter all this stuff going on right now. But to think, to, to stand in, you know, like our state capital or be in Washington and they say, well, you know, we have to legalize it because our trans community, they need jobs. And they're saying this is all the work they can do. And that's what like I fight against. Yeah. What do you mean that's the only? So it's such a mixed bag, but we do have the studies, you know, coming out of places like Germany that have had legalized prostitution for 20 years right. that now have 10 and 12 floor brothels. 
you know, buy, buy your schnitzel and a girl. These are signs that actually hang up. Okay. That after 20 years of legalizing it, it has not worked. They Mm -hmm. are trafficking more women, girls, men too, boys. Um, It's just becoming bigger and larger, habituated by society, normalized out of control. We fight for, no, we fight for society. We shouldn't be having this. So here in New York with everything going on and in our country to now this being a main issue, we've been fighting this for about three years now. I'm fighting for resources for people. I'm fighting for housing. I work with two, two safe houses, Carly, I work with. We only have two accredited for women, 18 plus in New York. I think this is shocking. Now, of course, we have some private things, okay? Right. But two of them, right? this is unacceptable. Uh, this is just unacceptable. Yeah. Okay, this is another program. We'll get back to that. I want I want to, you know, I'm curious about your thoughts, though, because, you know, we're a couple of decades apart. Actually, I could easily be your mother. Um, Let's talk. Do you want to talk about your mom at all in that journey? Yeah, always. Okay, well, I don't know. It's up to you. And I want you, you know... What I love about you, Carly, is because I look at you and I see that you could have a remarkable impact, you know, on on other women. And also, again, I'm going to say it, you know, girls in high school, girls in college, you know, you came to New York. What happened? What you should be looking for? Um, So share whatever you want about your mom, because I did follow along with that journey. You were writing things and going through it. So, yeah, I mean, it's um, it definitely was a. It's a, it's a life altering. There's like the before and the after version of me. You know what I mean? Losing her was, I always say it's both the best and worst thing that ever happened to me. Obviously, I think the worst is, is pretty, you know, obvious, but in the best ways it forced me. Um, I had two choices when she died. I really did. I could curl up in a ball and just give up. And believe me, I felt like it. I wanted to crawl in that casket with her. I was done there. That was my best friend in the whole world. That was, you know, my mother and I were so incredibly close after she and my father got divorced when I was five. She never remarried um, her choice. She just was kind of like, I'm good. Um, you know, she dated, but she just never had a desire to be someone's wife ever again. And she wanted to, because she got married really young, she got pregnant at 22 and married and and did the whole thing. She wanted to live her life. And so by example, she sort of created this, um, this, this pathway of me seeing a woman going a different route. She took a job where she traveled on the road um, 80% of the year and, and, and worked all over the country. She worked for a liquidation company and they would go into businesses that were like going out of business. And she would go in as the accountant and sort of like run the final three months of the sale and hopefully make them their money back and whatever. But she was every three months, she was in a different state. She was in a different city. She was doing this, you know, and she would just get in her car and drive. She sold her house. She just was, you know, and, um, she was fearless, truly, and um, and 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 so inspiring and and so empowering, but also one of the most um, emotionally intelligent women I've ever known. Wow. She had such a unique ability to disarm almost any person she met. She was one of those people that, like, you you find yourself just saying things to her, and you're like, I don't know why I'm telling you this, and she's like, Don't worry. I'm used to it um, yeah. because she was warm and, and, and non-judgmental and welcoming and kind and, and, and authentically kind, which is um, surprisingly very rare. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so when that light left my life, it was a crossroads for me and I was 29 and I had had a history of alcohol and drug use. And I think a lot of people in my life were very, very nervous that that was going to make a resurgence and um, that I was either going to just drink myself to death or have to be like committed that there was just no life after her. But for some reason, and I'll never know what it was. Um, I mean, I struggled with like debilitating anxiety. I just got this thing that like my my single mother who worked three jobs one summer picked blueberries so that I could go to theater camp because we had no money. Her whole life would be for nothing if I didn't go and see this the rest of the way through. It was like I made this deal in that moment of like, I had to see this through. 
I had to just see like what my real potential was. Nobody believed in me more. And I was going to just have to kind of like feel her from beyond. And, and I just, it was almost like, because I had nothing to lose, I felt more fearless than ever. I was like, well, nothing will ever hurt as bad as that. So let's just see what happens. And it was almost like I had it in the back of my mind that like, if it doesn't work out, I'll just go crawl in the hole. And 10 years, it's been 10 years now. Like I have found so many new incredible reasons to not crawl in the hole. That actually makes me cry. <laughs> um, because I think that that's what grief and, and moving on really is. You keep finding more reasons to not, to, to not go in the hole. And um, I met and fell in love with my husband. And I have been fortunate enough to be surrounded by the most incredible tribe of people. And, um, and I've been very fortunate and blessed to get to be a part of projects and play dress up for a living, which I'm very aware of how fortunate I am to do that and survive in that way. Um, I know that that's rare and there's not a day that I take it for granted. Every day that I get to go on set and go to work is the best day ever. Also because there's free food. Um, and, <laughs> and so, you know, that was, that was kind of, that was kind of what it is. And in, in, in that way, that's how I honor her. You know, I, I keep her going. I try to tell her story all the time. Um, you know, anybody who's, who's lost a parent or lost, um, husband or, a, or a child or a sibling will understand this feeling of like the day my mom died, my world stopped, but the world didn't. And that didn't sit right with me. It was like, I wanted everyone to be like, do you know what just happened? And it it's humbling in the way that it makes you feel so small, but it's also been the thing that like, I mean, sadly I've connected. I have, I have more friends now who've lost at least one parent than I do people who have both their parents alive. We got the dead parents club. It's the worst club to be a part of. But again, there's a sense of like community and, oh, I'm not alone in this. And, oh, you feel that too. And, hey, it's Mother's Day. Like that one hits really hard because it's the one people always think it's birthdays and Christmas, like Mother's Day, because you're just hit with like, don't forget to send your mom flowers. And I'm like, I can't, she's dead. You know what I mean? Like, And so, and they do laugh, but yeah, yeah. But you have to find the humor in it. And so like, that's what, like I have, I have a group of girlfriends. We're all part of the Dead Moms Club, all lost their mothers to cancer, all in our late twenties, early thirties. And um, some of them have like gone on to become moms now. And it's interesting how that loss sort of influences all the steps of your life, like how they parent. And then you think you miss them when they die. And then when I got married, that was really hard. And for my friend Allie, when she had a baby, that was really hard. And for, you know, and my friend Angie, like, it's just all these different things where like you have to, you continue, the grief just doesn't go away. It right. changes and it grows, but to me, I always saw the the pain as as a physical manifestation of our connection and love, and and once I started thinking of it like that, like a bond that couldn't even be broken by death, the amount that I love her couldn't even be broken by her ceasing to exist. And so now, when the pain comes, I feel like I welcome it because I'm like, yeah, that's right, you bet you bet it's still there and it, and, and it's not going anywhere and it has not diminished in any way. And, um, yeah, so it's, um, it's hard, but there is, there is life after it. The life is different, but there mm -hmm. is life after it. It can still be really beautiful. And, um, and, uh, and worth it. And I think, you know, and here I teared up too, because I remember reading when you were writing some things going through this. And I remember actually one time, actually by myself, I'm pretty tough, Carly, like just crying. I felt so. Here I well, go again. Here I go again. No. But you know what? But you know what? It, I, I think your connection obviously is even more powerful with her now. Yeah. You know, and, and this is this is a story also that has to be shared. It goes back to my community. You know, you have your community, you know, your 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 other women you're with. We need to lean on each other. We need to yeah. console each other. We need to talk about it. We need to, you know, we have youth mental health crisis going on, suicides right. out of control in this country. And so we can't let people feel alone. I, I do a lot of suicide talking to young people, you know, about different things. Um 
we have to not only just say once, you know, are you okay? It's a continual yeah. journey. It's like an everyday, you know, you have to constantly check in on people, constantly be there. I think what's them. hard about what you, what you're obviously doing too, is that you are recognizing, I think this is, this is a disconnect with the, with a lot of um, the older generations is that they tend to not realize that the the landscape of things now is not the landscape. It doesn't mean it's not taking anything away. It's not saying right. you guys didn't triumph and you didn't have a hard child and you didn't have your own challenges, but the challenges are different yes. now in a way that we as humans are actually not really equipped to deal with. Do you know what I mean? Like this, this is, this is now sort of advancing the scope of like what we as just human beings are are designed to cope with so yes it, it it is important to say like this whole like buck it up and you know this was stuff i heard as a kid all the time like you gotta have tough skin and you gotta have broad shoulders and like life's tough and i'm gonna and yes it is and you should strengthen yourself but not through this notion of sweeping it under the rug because we are facing huge mental health crises, not just in the youth, but also like the the rate of like women going through menopause. Again, to go back to like the studies that are done, like the rate of women that commit suicide is the highest between the ages of 45 and 60, because that's where women are going through their last physical hormonal change. And this is just studies are not done on this. We just it's called a hysterectomy because women were hysterical. They just got sort of diagnosed in this, this category of like, well, crazy women. And so when, when, when teenagers are going through their first hormonal change, that should be very well paid attention to. And sort like, like anything, same thing with like trans community, what is happening when, when people are transitioning, you're going through hormonal changes. That's why these things have to be studied and, and um and you know protected and and looked after by by a physician so but then also like these are just the larger conversations of like okay so yes we are facing one of the biggest mental health crises we see it in our unhoused community we we're, we're seeing it in the children we're seeing it in 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 all of the generations across the scope people are becoming more agoraphobic since the pandemic people, yes. you know it, it, it's a lot of we're losing our sense of community but then also like let's have a conversation about why this country has higher stats than anyone else what are we putting in our food it's the red dye number 40s and the yellow dye number fives and like and i hate to say it i love a big mac i'm obviously i you know thick thighs save lives like don't come for me like i love a big mac but there's something to that where like <laughs> we're we're literally making ourselves yes. crazy and then they're monetizing on that by being like well here go to the pharmaceutical companies you can get ozempic and you can get this and we'll put you on the legal version of fen fen or hey how about i up your dose of prozac but like what we're not doing is talking about how like really we're losing our ability to connect with one another and our sense of community and like that tribal that's i feel like i don't it's not a one size fits all again mental health is important your relationship with medicine, whatever is, is everybody's own personal journey. But I think that we would need things a lot less if we felt more yes. connected and protected. It feels very everyone for themselves now. I think that's probably the disconnect you feel coming up. It was like, Hey man, we're in this together. And now it's very like, you get yours, I'll get mine. I, I don't even know where to start with that because, um, yes, I was also, I was <laughs> no, 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 because there's so much to talk about. We're going to have to have a part two, because I know you have to go in a little bit, but you know, I was also a kid during Vietnam and even, even being like in the third and fourth grade, we, we wore POW bracelets. I, right. I don't know, like even little kids at age were aware of it. I'm only yeah. now as an adult studying up on Vietnam. That's a whole nother story, like watching documentaries, reading about it, what a waste that was. But right. like it was a feeling of uh, more of coming together. I remember right. when they started, I was in the fourth grade. It was the first, um, oh, what do you call it? Uh, Earth Day or something. Uh -huh. I remember being, and our assignment was go out of the classroom. You know, if there's any garbage like on the ground or sidewalk, right. pick it up. Like that's where that started. You said it very well. I think COVID obviously changed because I say now before COVID, after COVID, like that's yeah. where it used to be before 9-11, right. after 9-11. Then it's before COVID, after COVID. Um, 
it feels you're correct very much like people are really in it for themselves and yeah. i am trying very hard to if i if i affect one person a day carly because people are like why why are you bothering lynn what are you doing you know you're solving human trafficking sexual exp i'm like I'm raising awareness. If I help Maybe one person you're starting a, day, a conversation that people exactly. are afraid to have. Exactly. It's That's like important. one thing a day yep. and I've done my job and I wake up yep. every day, one thing, go to bed every day. Um, it, it does feel very much, but I, I'm very hopeful going into 2024. We can't continue, you know, as a society like this, the pendulum Carly has to swing back. I'm seeing little signs of it. You know, we're working very hard. It's, is school by school to get the phones out of the schools just during the school day. Right. And the schools we've done it for and with, we're seeing major progress. The kids, you know, talk to each other. They're doing better academically. The teachers and students are relating better. Sure. They could pick up the phone after school, you know, when they check their phones in the morning, but at right. least for the five, six hours, if they're in school, they have to, they can't yeah. isolate. Right. Yeah. So we have all these little programs going on to just bring it back. People are like, what should I get my my children for, you know, holiday gifts? Because everybody wants new devices. Yeah. I'm like, well, in addition to that, because I can't really tell anybody what to buy their child sure. or teen, buy a hardcover book. Yeah. Let's get let's get kids, you know, they feel it, they turn a page, and then you talk yeah. about it. Just simple things like that. I never thought, Carly, I would have to say, you know, buy a book, buy a puzzle. But a new study came out, good news this holiday season. Sales are news? booming. No, sales are booming. Books, oh, puzzles, good. board games, dolls, Legos, Lincoln Logs. So my theory of the pendulum love is Lincoln swinging. Logs. <laughs> I, I still love them too. I mean, the, my theory of the pendulum is swinging back. Yeah. I'm, I'm right on the money. Let's finish up with, you're starring right now in this movie. Tell us anything you want to share about the experience. What's up yeah. next for you? Because I'm going to hold you to a part two. I'm never okay. Going to I would love it. Yeah, I, I I had a feeling we probably would because I can, uh, I could get into these subject matters. So it's called Holiday in the Vineyards. It's love currently it. I was I think it's number six on that uh, top ten today. It was number four yesterday. I don't know how it all works. I don't know. Um, but um, top ten globally, it's very exciting. It's a really like you said, it's just a feel good. Yeah sort of, you know, rom-com, but what I, what I really enjoyed about this mostly, and one of the reasons that I said yes to do it, aside from the fact that, again, I just love to play dress up for a living, is that I felt like, so I, I, I play the role of uh, Cindy, which is Val's best friend, Val, I don't want to give too much away, but um, Valerie's, uh, uh, Valerie, Valentina, I don't know why I said Valerie, I was thinking Valerie Bertinelli for a minute, like her had just like her face popped in my head and I was like, oh my God, she's so beautiful. And then I'm like, that's not her name, her name is Valentina. She's a gorgeous Latina woman. Um, uh, so is again, kind of in the aftermath of grief and losing her husband with two small children. And so what I loved so much about this character is like, yes, she's the comic relief. She's funny. She's meant there to sort of be like, yes, girl, it's time to put on a cha-cha nail and like get back out there and like whatever. But also there are, I think people will be surprised to see there are some sentimental moments of sort of women supporting women and the true and real conversations that women have with one another in those really dark times. You know, I think as women, we we have to be a lot of different roles to each other, especially like if you did come up with, with say absent father or mother or whatever issues that you have, when you find true, true loving and incredible women in your life, they sort of serve many roles. Yes. And that's what I loved about this. You know, oftentimes two female characters are either competing for the same guy or competing for the same job or competing for something. And um, it's not often that you see these female relationships empower each other and be yes. there for each other and both be like sassy and push you when you need to be pushed, but also hold you when you need to be held. And um, that's what I loved the most about this and and that I think sets it apart. I think people will be surprised that, yes, it is a feel-good rom-com. There obviously are your quintessential holiday tropes that you're going to run into. But I think people will be surprised that they will feel something with this that and, and that it's intended to. Um, and I'm really proud of it. And it was an incredible experience working on it. Everyone in the cast, uh, the, the woman, Sol Rodriguez, who plays the... Uh, lead character, Valentina, not Valerie. Um, and I got very close. We hit it off immediately and both really understood the assignment of like the female relationship, almost just as important as the romantic relationship in the movie. And 
Um, and it was just a lot of fun and it's exciting to see it do well. Um, because anytime you do something that you love and believe in and then, and you see it be successful, it's like having a child, you know what I mean? Like, you, it's just nice to have other people be like, oh, your kid is great. And you're like, do you think so? I think so. Um, so it's, it's a lot of fun. And, um, so I'm excited for 2024. I have no, because of the strike, um, this was the only project I, I, we filmed it right before the strike. And so this is the project that I have going on right now, looking forward to a very prosperous, hopefully 2024. Um, I, um, I have some film projects that I've written that we're taking out this year. So, um, you know, just, just really looking, looking forward to it. It's, it's hard sometimes, I think, um, as an entertainer to live in the constant unknown, I'm used to it at this point, but I think, I think everyone is kind of living in that now. And so, um, I think having faith, not just in the universe that things will work out, but honestly faith in yourself. I have to know at the end of the day that like, I have shown myself at this point in my life that no matter what comes my way, I have the resources and the integrity and the intelligence to handle anything that comes my way. And so it's taken a little bit of the fear out of the unknown for me because I'm like, well, bring it. What else you got? You know, Carly Gibson, that is being a warrior. I think so. I, I, I know it is. I always like to say, um, you know, we're peaceful warriors. But that warrior is never a word, Carly, I ever used in my life. And I sat up in bed, never used it in my life. I sat up in bed one morning and turned to my husband. Uh, it was the beginning of COVID. And I said, I'm going to become a warrior. <laughs> He's like, what? And I, my idea is just to like empower, engage, yeah. talk, have, have tough conversations or, or just make, you know, women and girls and men and boys too, whatever, you know, yeah. it, include everybody again, using, you know, like what you said, not, not judging. The only thing I'll tell you I'm judgy about and firm about is anything to do with kids. Like, you know, that's bad, yeah. uh, you know, but kids just need love. Yeah. You can't believe Carly, what they tell me, like my parents are too busy for me. Once I gain their like, you know, a, a trust and things when I'm doing focus groups or whatever, or my father says, come back, I'm busy on the computer. Like we, we have to, as role models, do better. The kids are indeed watching, yeah. you know, everything oh, yeah. we're doing. So oh, finish yeah. finish us up. I thank you so much because it's the busy holiday season. It's almost Christmas. What I do know, you I'm, like, I'm leaving to, after this to go to the airport to pick my family up from the airport to begin the holiday mayhem. So, so you, you, you're in charge of the holiday family mayhem this year. Is that how that's this working? Year? It's on me. Well, that's what happens when you become the matriarch of the family. My bro everyone in my family was, it's funny. It's almost like as women, and I'm sure many women can relate to this. It's like, they just kind of like, that one's gone. So they're like, well, what should we do? And you're like, none of, none of you men can think for yourself. <laughs> no, they don't. They, that's a, that's another program. We have a lot of problems going on, but you know what? I'm actually looking forward. I don't care if it sounds old fashioned taking my time, cooking some food, yes. prepare, setting the table with a tablecloth. You know, it's like therapeutic for me. I love with, it. You know, I love just to host. We actually yeah. are, we are going to host Christmas here with my family and some of my like wayward friends who I, you know, Good. I have a couple of friends who are not welcome in their family because of their life choices and whatever. Mm -hmm. And so they're welcome here. So we're doing a whole thing here and um, it'll be a packed house, but, uh, but who doesn't love a packed house? Who doesn't love a packed house? With a little music going, a couple right? of candles in the background, or you're yeah. in California, you need the LEDs, right? I think you have to. You I know can't... it's raining. It's been raining for like two days. I'm like, I saw, with I these saw... taxes, you better get it together, California. <laughs> I I saw this morning, like they're predicting like a lot of rain. I didn't want to really bring know. it up, but uh, be careful there. Well, give us any final thoughts you have before I let you go. So you're going to drive to what? We have to drive to like LAX? Got to go to LAX. You better put that seatbelt on. Put those holiday tunes. It, I'm a rule follower. <laughs> That's the thing about me that I think shocks people the most is like I am. My husband laughs at me all the time because he's like, what are what are you so beholden to? Like, I'm like, but you can't do that. That's against the rules. Um but that was, that's a testament to Renee because she was like a busy working single mom. She sort of, 
she knew that she wasn't going to actually be there physically to tell us, you know, no, you can't do that. So she like instilled this insane little conscience in me where I, oh, I'm, I, I like lose my mind if I think I've like done something wrong. Really? I'm kind of a rule follower myself, um, which is why my husband doesn't like me driving because I go the speed limit. Right. You could go. You're like, no, I can't. Three car lengths between us. <laughs> you know, I'm one of those. Um, but anyway, I am just so thrilled to reconnect with you, to talk yeah, with me you. Too. Uh, you. You warm my heart. You mm -hmm. have a tremendous um, heart and feeling. And yeah. I just want to be part of your life. And I Get you know what I, was, I Before I let you go, I thought of one thing, Carly. I just thought of it. I have to share with you. I, I went over to Hairspray like during a matinee one time. Uh-huh. Cause I used to like people would come, we do the whole house seat thing. And during like, you know, the intermission, I'd run over and give them a t-shirt or see how they're doing or whatever right. I was doing, trying to be a hostess, you know. Right. And I remember I stood in the back, one of these mat, I was waiting. I was waiting for like the break or something. You were dancing so feverishly that all I kept thinking to myself was. How does she keep her wig on? How is that? <laughs> is that wig gonna come off? Because I'm telling you, you were twirling and and jumping, and I was like, I used to like staple that thing to my head. I, I used was to like, get like, oh. the most horrible like <laughs> like headaches from it because yeah, they were like they were putting extra pins in. Because here's the thing, they knew too. They were like, if that wig falls off, that's on us. That makes the wig department look bad. So they were like putting those big old pins in there. But yeah. Um, what if you know it's funny? Okay, so I probably shouldn't <laughs> tell you this because I'm not supposed to have it, but I actually have a bootleg of me doing the show that someone gave me a hundred years ago. And I haven't I hadn't watched it and I can't tell you when. And my husband, of course, I we met much after, and he's not musical theater at all. He's in real estate. When I met him, he was a the lead singer of a punk rock band. Like he doesn't know much about musicals. And so I um I, I had this and I'd forgotten all about it. A friend of mine had passed away and they sent me a bunch of stuff from his house. And I was like, oh my God, this. And so we sat and watched it and it was, it was very fun to share it with him, but it was cathartic for me to watch. Um, because I think, because I was so young, it almost feels like, I know it's a part of my life. I was there, but I was like a child. So yeah. it, it's not the freshest memory and re-watching it was almost like it was like I because I'm 20 years from it now it almost is like I could appreciate it in the way that like my mom did where I was like oh my god I'm so little oh my god how am I doing this how am I doing this at 19 years old what okay and then I just it was a whole thing in therapy like I had to cry because you know I was like oh oh I wish that I wish that she was protected more and that's why I just, I, in it, I've done the work. It's taken me 20 years to like heal all the things and do all the things. But that's why I love what you're doing. Cause even if it is just one person, that one, you know, it's a domino. That one person yes. then goes yes. off and changes someone's life. I mean, it matters what you're doing. It's important what you're doing. It's important to be a warrior and not a worrier, you know, like to, to take on, like I said, that's your path. You can crawl in the hole. You could get, you can become a warrior. You can become a warrior. You can crawl in the hole or you can make somebody's life worth it, you know? And, um, and so I applaud what you're doing. I'm, Aww. I'm very honored to be a, a small part of it. And, um, and that, you know, you were brought into my life at that time and um and that you're still there i just i adore you and i'm really grateful for you oh carly gypson i love you so much and your mom is with us today i kind of feel it so proud of you she always is. so so proud of you though that all you were doing and just so happy that you were part of this fantastic movie holiday in the vineyards that you really explained because it really touched me and I'm like, oh, a Netflix movie, you know, right. obviously I'm interested to see you. And But I'm like, this is a really good, feel good kind of thing that I liked. And you said it was a relationship between the both of you, both women. And it goes along with yeah. my warriors I'm trying to teach. This is what we need more of. So I want to yeah. thank you. And I want everybody, because I know everybody has Netflix now. Holiday yeah, come on. Yeah. <laughs> what we, we, it's always, I don't care. It's going to be in the top 10 every holiday season going forward. It's going to be what, like one of those, you know, perennial holiday classic favorites. I feel well, like. I hope so. 
Oh, it will. Um, look, I wish you nothing but the best of luck. We will talk again Thank soon. You. You're stuck yes, with me now. It. You're stuck with yeah, me yeah. now. Uh, you are very knowledgeable about so many things. I feel so good about you and your future. And I just want you to have the best holiday with family and friends. Thank you for taking Me in too. those that can't be. Because I always tell people, check on your neighbors and friends. Make sure somebody has a place Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's to yep. go. Offer your home. So for you to say that, Carly Gibson, you are a warrior. And everybody should follow you on Instagram. That's yes, IG. And I love you so much. Please drive safely you. in the rain. I will. I will. I we will talk again soon. And I'm going okay. to have this video up later for everybody to enjoy. Right. So Merry Christmas. Happy Merry holidays. Christmas. Happy New Year. We will talk again soon. Thank you. Okay. Carly sounds Jackson. good. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.